Hey, I'm really excited to be monitoring, uh, monitoring, moderating uh, this panel on place. It's place in um, literature is one of my favorite topics. I teach courses in it. Um, I loved reading all of your work and I'm excited to introduce you. So um, is everybody here? Let's see, is, is Corinne there? Oh, there's yeah. Corinne. Hi, Corinne. Um, okay, so we have today Corinne Witt, Amelia Modes, Dan Carroll, and Elizabeth Wayne. Um, are you, um, everyone happy to go in that order? Okay, um, so what I'll do is, um, as each of you speak, I will do your bio right before so people remember your name and a little bit about you, um, since I, I hate when everyone does the blurbs all at the beginning and then you can't remember who is who. So I'll do them before each person. And so Corinne, it looks like you are up first. So Corinne Witt is in the MAWP program and hopes to graduate in December 2021. Corinne enjoys reading African-American nonfiction, YA lit, and fantasy fiction. She also enjoys writing travel fiction, short stories, and dabbles in playwriting. After graduate, graduating, Corinne envisions herself working at a publishing company in their PR department while creating new pieces of writing. And Corinne is also the awesome intern for Slag Glass City and is doing really great social media for us this term. So select, check out the Slag Glass City blog later. Hey, Corinne, you are on. Thank you. So many of the pieces that I've written are inspired by memories of things that I've wanted to experience. I love finding ways to rework my own experience into a story for someone else to enjoy or find relatable. Parasailing and Punta Cana was inspired by memory of an activity that I experienced on vacation to the Dominican Republic. I remember being in high school, but I'm unsure of what year and how old I was. I really wanted to do something exciting on this trip, and the idea to go parasailing seemed like a good idea. But once I got in that boat, did reality start to sink in, and I felt nervous. Once I hit the skies, I never wanted to come down. While parasailing was an exciting experience, it also showcased, showcased the side of Punta Cana that I was sheltered by due to the image of the tropical carefree resort. Many of the travel stories that I started to write include some aspect of life that is hidden from the vacationer's eyes. I felt it was important to include these aspects because it shows the real and authentic version of that specific place. It showed the person behind the friendly smiles and welcoming gestures. From Parasailing in Punta Cana, I've chosen to read a section in the, from the middle. This section combines my initial thoughts of going parasailing with questions of life outside the glitzy resort. It's one of my favorite sections as it allows me to relive the memory of going on this adventure. Although it feels like it's been more than five years since this trip, whenever I read this scene, I remember it vividly. Jorge snaps my harness to the cord and firmly tugs to make sure I'm snug. He smiles and assures me that everything is safe in Spanish. Thankfully, I understand him, him as my Spanish knowledge is good enough for me to allow me, myself to make conversation as well as other things like order food and ask for directions. I take in my surroundings one last time crash of the waves, people zipping by on jet skis and boats, and small whispers between others awaiting the same fate. He starts to count down and I close my eyes in anticipation. Yes, I take in cal deep calming breaths to relax myself. Nueve, I wonder if Jorge can hear my heart beating. Thump, thump, thump. It feels like it might rip out of my chest. Thump, 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 thump. My heart is beating faster than a drum. Ocho, God, I whisper to myself, please don't let me die in Punta Cana. Although it is a nice place to die, I'd rather not have death arrive through being flung like a rubber band across the ocean or being sunk like an anchor into the deep, dark water. Siete, I clasp my hands together only to find them dampened, not by seawater, but by my own nerves. Siete, when I first asked my mom to do this, she didn't say no at first. She asked why I wanted to do this like most concerned parents. I couldn't answer her then, but, then I, but I think I know why now. There's something about risking your own life that makes you look at the world differently. It makes you appreciate all the same things that you take for granted. Cinco, were the couples before me just as nervous or are they really good at hiding that they're terrified? Cuatro, after I asked my mom a few more times, she finally agreed to let me go, but only if I had someone come along. Now I'm joint with a woman who's trembling like a nervous chihuahua. Tres, I wonder how much of this place I'll be able to see from up there. The people who work at the resort I'm staying at don't talk much about their home lives. Maybe it's better that way. Then they get to live a fantasy of dancing the night away, 
delicious foods they'll never get to see in their own kitchen and exotic people. Then they don't have to face the depressing truth of their reality. Dos. The butterflies swirling in my stomach expand in realization that my moment is almost here. Uno. I no longer feel the boat's cold surface beneath my toes. My eyes automatically shut as brightness shines through the darkness of my own doubt. I open my eyes and take in the sun and ocean. Everything has shrunken within a period of five seconds. The once tall, towering palm trees now resemble tiny artificial trees used to decorate cakes. As I looked past the shady palm trees and expensive resorts, I saw some of the homes and mountains that the Kana had to offer. These homes were nothing more than former shells of schools and huts they make if they have children. Peering closer, I saw the native people in their routines. Children chasing chickens down a road while mothers not too far behind carrying baskets and speaking Spanish. Men with large machetes in a secluded hut harvesting cocoa beans from trees and more remnants of what used to be schools and stores. This was their normal, their everyday lives. They weren't phased by walking through large piles of debris from former houses. They weren't phased by the tourists who would come through trying to enforce English in a community that seemed happy with their own language. The only entertaining aspect was seeing those children chase chickens just like how children back in more developed country chase dogs and cats. I saw what the people who work at the resort must be trying to escape, or maybe what they're thinking about as they go to their jobs each day. While they serve tours by carrying luggage or holding trays and mimosas, maybe they're thinking about how their home has just become another tourist, or tourist spot. Possibly they're enjoying their escape from their scary reality. Thank you. Thank you, Corinne. If everyone can do a little snap or clap or something to, yay. Okay, great job, Corinne. Um, okay. Amelia Modes, am I pronouncing your name right, Amelia? It's Modes. Modes, okay. Um, Amelia Modes is a third year undergraduate student studying English, creative writing, and media and cinema studies with a minor in writing for film and television. Amelia has been involved with Crook and Folly and the Vagina Monologues for the past two years. She also works at the DePaul Writing Center and serves as the Chicago Quarter Mentor. She enjoys writing creative nonfiction and poetry. Um, Neighborhood Nostalgia is a piece she wrote for her study abroad class, City as Character. Um, let's welcome Amelia. Amelia, you're, um, you're, you're muted. There we go. Thank you. Um, so like Professor Borch said, this is a piece I wrote for my City as Character class that Michelle Morano taught this past winter quarter, exploring where I grew up. And it's a little bit meta because now I'm in the same childhood home I talk about in this piece. So I'll be reading the piece in the entirety because it's pretty short. I've lived in the same house my entire life. The light blue colonial with the navy shutters sits in the middle of a tree-lined suburban street a block away from the freeway. The freeway can take you to Detroit in 15 minutes, in Canada in 30, yet I stayed within the safety of the blue house on Buckingham Street. My first friends and enemies formed on the street where I grew up. Jasmine and Jalen lived directly across from us in a small brick ranch. Jasmine was a year older than me and we were inseparable. We played on the wooden playscape my dad built in my backyard and rode bikes the five blocks up to the elementary school playground. Swings, tennis courts, jungle gyms, it was a child's dream afternoon. Jalen was a year younger than me, always on the periphery of Jasmine and I's playdates, but never the first chosen playmate. He and I were both the youngest in our families, so the extra year I had on him made me feel just a little bit cooler for once. No longer was I the annoying additional sibling. Jasmine and Jalen lived with their mom, who I only referred to as Miss Anne. You could hear her yelling from across the street at her kids or her dogs, you never really knew. Jasmine and her family moved away when I was eight. They moved an hour west to own a farm with horses. We used to travel out there together and ride the horses, but after they moved, I stopped riding. Next door lived Julie and Steve. Their house was the exact replica of mine, but it was painted a banana yellow. They lived with their two kids, Diego and Sofia. You could always see them walking back and forth on the street, moving between their home and that of Juanita, their grandmother, who was only five houses down the street. Juanita lived with her husband, but I never knew his name. I was always jealous that they lived so close to their grandparents, when the reality was that two-thirds of my own lived less than two miles from my house. It seemed like an unfathomably long distance to my young self. 
When I was 11 years old, Steve passed away, leaving behind his wife and two kids, our friends and neighbors. There was no funeral, or if there was, I did not go. My mom made meals and delivered them next door, offering comfort the only way she knew how, through your stomach. I used to hang out with Sophia and Diego when we were younger, but we didn't really see one another except in passing after this. I wondered if Steve had gone to heaven. I was still under the influence of my Catholic upbringing. I never lost someone close to me, and as a kid who slept in her parents' bedroom more times than she'd like to admit, the thought of losing a parent terrified, nay, terrifies me. Although I lost my friendship with Sophia and Diego, I still have never lost as much as I have. With neighbors and older sisters, there was almost always someone to hang out with on any given day. My older sister, Natalie, had always been the athlete of the family. Soccer, basketball, track, cuss country. She's done it all, and she has the school records to show for it. It was one of the crisp days near the end of the summer, with the sun shining and the temperature dropping, when my sister and a group of our cousins were kicking around a soccer ball in the backyard. Someone kicked it a bit too hard, sending it over the fence next door. No, not into Steve and Julie's backyard, but into the yard on the right side of my house, into Dave and Kim's backyard. Dave could typically be seen mowing his front lawn in a wife beater and dress slacks, and Kim could be seen in her robe and slippers, grabbing the mail occasionally, but you never saw her actually leave the house. Someone, probably Natalie, jumped over the fence to their backyard to retrieve the soccer ball. As soon as she hit the grass on the other side, you heard the quiet click of the neighbor's back door being unlocked. Kim slid the doors open and questioned why Natalie was in her yard, yelling at her while her mop of curls blew in the wind, scaring Natalie into going back home. Kim stole the ball, and we never got it back. In my mind, Kim was public enemy number one of the street, followed by the twins on the corner of the block who once bullied my other sister, Sophia, when she was a child and they were teenagers. Life on Buckingham Street was not perfect. Lawns went yellow-green, front yard gardens filled with weeds, and neighbors yelled at kids that were not theirs. But despite this, Buckingham was where I learned the importance of community and neighborly love. Andrea and Conrad across the street always offered their pools to us on hot summer days. Wally down the street was constantly working on his baby blue 66 Thunderbird in the driveway and always said hi when you passed him. During the holidays, Christmas cards and cookies were exchanged between one another. As kids grew older, graduation cards and wedding invites were stamped and sent. I only go back to the Blue Colonial on Buckingham during holidays and school breaks now. There are new neighbors across the street in Jasmine and Jalen's house with their own family, and I don't know their names. Diego goes to college, and Sophia is about to graduate high school. The playscape has not been in my backyard for years. And yet, Andrea still makes her shortbread cookies at Christmas time, Kim still never leaves the house, and Wally still says hi when I pass him. I call Chicago home now, but Buckingham Street always welcomes me back with open arms. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Amelia. Okay, next up is Dan Carroll. Uh, Dan Carroll is a writer and student at DePaul University where he's a double ma major in English uh, with a creative writing concentration and media and cinema studies. In 2019, he graduated from Kingswood Oxford High School in Connecticut. He has fiction and poetry in the upcoming edition of Crook and Folly, and he has had creative nonfiction published in Polyphony Lit. He was once called the opposite of clever. Go for it, Dan. Hi, so uh, this is a short uh, short fiction story that I wrote. Um, it's called Safeway, like the, the grocery store. Um, and I wrote it for uh, my creative writing class with Kathleen Rooney. It was, originally the assignment was uh, ekphrastic. Um, so the piece of art that I chose to sort of spin off of or respond to was a photograph called 99 Cent by Andreas Gursky. He makes these uh, like massive photographs that are often like digital composites of many smaller photographs. And they're often about um, like the clash between nature and like the world economy um, and just like globalization. Um, but in this one particularly, it's incredibly overwhelming because it's just uh, the aisles of a grocery store and all the artificial colors that are there. Um, so yeah, I was inspired by that. Um, and yeah, this is, the, this is the story. Andrea was gazing at the scuffed beige linoleum before her while her mother talked to her friend Dorothy. 
from PTA, remember? Andrea did not, but kept quiet. Dorothy was apparently just running some errands before she had to pick her daughter up from school. How are you doing, though? Dorothy said to Andrea and her mother. Oh, I'm just trying to get some use out of this one while she's not in school for the week, Margaret said. Andrea shrugged, instead looking at every cereal box that demanded her attention, every reflection of the sun from the plastic bags, the tag on her hoodie scratching at her neck, the bread smashed at the bottom of the cart, the matchbook stuffed in her capris, the orange juices, yellow juices, juices of all colors that would never, never come home with them. Dorothy nodded apologetically at the two and then said a pleasant goodbye before the silence grew too big to break. Margaret continued scanning the grocery store's aisles. She was tall enough to see over the shelves and into the other aisles, a feature she took pride in, unlike some other women who desired a particular flavor of fun-sized blonde daintiness. Her scraggly black hair rested on her back as she walked. Her daughter's black hair was much shorter and still recovering from an attempted straightening two days before. Andrea took no pride in being the tallest in her class, nor in her freak status by her classmates. Unlike her mother, she had no aptitude for math, though Margaret assured herself that it was okay. Things always work out, and kids these days seem to be much better at figuring things out for themselves than she was at their age. The two walked through a few more aisles without speaking. I'm gonna look for the bathroom, said Andrea, as she stretched her hoodie sleeves further down her arms. No, you're not, Margaret said. There was no way she was gonna give her daughter another opportunity to start a fire in the bathroom. Andrea had already gotten in enough trouble. She was lucky she had only gotten suspended. Andrea sighed loudly. Do you think I like dragging you around all day? Margaret said to silence. Okay, Margaret said, go get the toothpaste. Meet me at the registers once you're done. And if you're not back in two minutes, I'm not gonna be happy. Andrea muttered a thank you and went on her way. The toothpaste, from left to right, followed a life cycle. It began with a pile of various purple sparkly tubes adorned with spaceships and cartoon fruits singing songs. In the middle was a column of red, white, and blue tubes advertising cavity protection and showing teeth surrounded by bubbles. On the right was a stack of black and white toothpaste warning about sensitive teeth and attempting to protect whatever enamel was left. The tube of toothpaste that Andrea was holding said it would last about three months, so getting four would last her enough through the year. Another year of yellow teeth, she thought, at the end of which she'd be older but still unescapably herself. She'd buy four more tubes of toothpaste and she'd do the same thing next year, and so on until sometime she preferred not to think about. Across from the toothpaste, Andrea spotted a clothing display that sold knockoff versions of the athletic shorts that the skinnier girls often wore. Next to those were the khaki shorts her teachers and other old people wore. Andrea considered that she could ask her mother to buy her some of the athletic shorts, the kind that sh showed her legs, and her mother would probably say yes, but then she'd just be returning to school wearing a worse version of what everyone else was wearing. Standing between the toothpaste and the clothes, Andrea saw each year stretched out before her like mile markers, each one identical and getting shorter, by a degree so small that she wouldn't notice until she turned around to see how far she'd gone. She saw every year that she'd spend looking towards the next, dreaming she'd grow into herself and fit in, a dream that only made her feel worse because she knew that at the end she'd still be a worse version of everybody else. And she felt even worse than that day at school when that boy had called her ugly. And even though she'd been called ugly before, and she'd been called it by people whose opinions she cared about more than him, something inside her still broke, and she escaped into the bathroom to do the only thing she could control. And looking back, because looking at her future was unbearable, she remembered how all she wanted to do was light a match and make a few more burns on her arm. She wasn't thinking about where to put the match when she heard someone walk towards the bathroom, so she just threw it in the trash instead of the toilet like she should have. But by the time she realized her mistake, she was already being called into the principal's office and was already being called a freak, as well as a pyro and other much more humiliating things, all of which she tried to forget as she was being sent home from school. But the weight of all of those thoughts threatened to drown her. So all she thought was, if that was the kind of freak they thought she was, then that was the kind of freak she'd be. If they thought she was evil, then she would be evil for them. As Andrea left the store with her mother, she barely even remembered the pair of athletic shorts that she had left burning in the middle of the empty aisle. 
Margaret put a kind and unaware arm around Andrea as they pushed their cart. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. And finally, wrapping up is Elizabeth Wayne. Elizabeth is a junior majoring in communications and media. For her, writing is one of the simplest ways to further human connection, and she loves to focus on relationships and culture in her pieces. Elizabeth hopes to one day write for a media publication that actively works to spread people's voices. So welcome, Elizabeth. Hi, um, I'm Elizabeth, and this piece is called Service with a Smile. Part one, new beginnings. One week before I started my junior year of high school, I needed a job. I wanted to save for a car, so I applied for and was hired at a local grocery chain called Heinen's. In Cleveland, Heinen's is an institution, a mix between a mom and pop shop and Whole Foods, offering suburbanites $10 bottles of freshly squeezed orange juice, but also a smile. A friend told me to apply, and seeing they paid a whopping, a whopping 15 cents above minimum wage, I agreed. My first day, the cheerful, low-slung brick building with huge windows, white trimming, and a steady stream of customers suddenly seemed large and imposing. I pulled at my scratchy uniform, a starchy, light blue button-down and newly purchased khaki pants, ran my tongue nervously over my braces, and headed inside. Eight registers were grouped together in pairs, so that two cashiers would be working with their backs to each other, shuffling back and forth on rubber mats on the floor. Rustic wooden bins stacked high with summer fruits and vegetables, shining brightly with water from, from the overhead sprayer were straight ahead. Hello, a short, heavyset woman with thin brown hair greeted me. She introduced herself as Kitty and told me she would be my manager. Her dark eyes seemed to drill into my brain as she trained me on the register, thousands of instructions flying out of her mouth. Try not to mess up the money. It's a pain when I have to come over, she said, and my heart pounded a little bit. Don't go to the head managers unless you absolutely need to, she told me. Got it? I was not sure. Patterns. Luckily, I was trained by another cashier named Matt. About 20, he had long black hair that fell over his eyes, which made him constantly jerk his neck to clear his vision. He was a cashier wizard, barely looking as he swiped the groceries over the scanner. There's three stages to working here he told me philosophically. At first, you don't know what you're doing and it's confusing. Then you start to know how things work and you get really excited. After that wears off, there's nothing. Just a tedious, boring, empty numbness. Great, I said. The front end was split into factions, part-time and full-time workers, baggers and cashiers. As Matt took me around introducing me, patterns emerged. The part-timers were high school and college students trying to earn extra spending money, while the full-time workers, almost all middle-aged women, worked to pay rent. The customers were not allowed to take their carts outside and instead would pull their Lexuses and Teslas to the front where their groceries would be loaded into the trunk by one of the baggers, a grim smile plastered on their faces as they heaved the heavy bags. Family. As summer turned to fall and winter, I grew into my abilities at work. At work. I no longer looked at the number of items on the belt with abject fear. A green pepper, produce code 4065. A Honeycrisp apple was 3128. A sweet potato, 4688. On Sundays, when the store was the busiest, the front end would take on the rhythm of an overworked machine. The beeps of the registers rang in, sym in symphonic chords around me as I would quickly scan all the items and then turn to help the bagger pack it neatly into plastic bags. It was a rhythmic frenzy dance that made my ankles throb and my back ache. A constant stream of thoughts would race through my head. How quickly can I pack this produce? How fast can a bagger replace a carton of broken eggs? Why was nobody helping me? And it never seemed fast. It never seemed to be fast enough. My coworkers slowly began to feel less like strangers. I knew that Marsha would use her 15 minute breaks to smoke two cigarettes out front and Teresa wore gloves all the time because she was a horrible germaphobe. Khalid would spend his paychecks on a pair of $200 shoes then asked me to keep them in my car so his dad wouldn't find them. Jacob was selling oxy pills in the break room and Martin was working to send money to his family in the Philippines. I wondered about their lives outside the store, about the children they had to support, where they lived, and what life events had led some of them to be middle-aged and working in a grocery store. I learned that Kitty had worked at the store for 40 years and that she lived in a small house across the parking lot. 
the roof of which you could see from the first register. We were a strange little family bound together by the pains of working and a mutual dislike of our boss. Battles. When I came into work with a shiny blue nose, a shiny blue stud in my nose, the only thing my, co my coworkers told me was, Kitty's going to kill you. Facial jewelry was against the Heinen's brand. When Kitty told me to take it out, I refused. This turned into a vicious battle that lasted for months. She would tell me to take the goddamn piercing out, I would refuse, and in retaliation, she would cut my hours. I started to take out the, the piercing when I knew she would be working, and when she would leave, I would push it through the unhealed hole, sending a shooting pain throughout my face and neck. When she found out about my routine, she didn't schedule me for a week. Like Jekyll and Hyde, she could be caring one moment, and then she would turn around and say a remark so biting that I would go on my breaks crying. Her view of me was not how I saw myself, and I needed to prove the real me to her. Carpet fibers. Suburban dog days dragged by, the braces came off, confidence was gained. The store continued to be an endless source of entertainment. The soap opera scandals were never ending. Claire was dating Josh from the dairy department. Colin got fired for threatening to shoot up the store. Ted, the, Todd, the, he, the head manager, was cheating on his wife with Glenda from the deli. Certain events could be counted on. The man dubbed the Unabomber for his long gray hair and sunglasses would come in every day at five with pea-soaked sweatpants to buy a six-pack of Heineken. Kevin, the middle-aged man from grocery, would call you beautiful and ask for a hug, and the old woman with the red glasses would give you checks that bounced. One day, a cashier named Devin pointed to the white-haired man with sunglasses who had just walked away from my register. You know that guy killed Amy Mahalovic, right? He said referring to the 10-year-old girl who had been kidnapped behind the store in 1989 and was later found stabbed to death in a field. What? I asked in disbelief. Yeah, the carpet fibers on her body matched the ones in his car, and they found some DNA samples. They never prosecuted him because he was friends with the police chief or something. I would always pretend that my register was closed whenever I saw the man after that. Fresh starts. As I turned 18, I began to plan a life away from the small store in Lake Erie. Katie refused to let me work as a cashier when I returned to the store for summer break and instead sent me to work in the produce department. I worked 40 hours a week in a freezing concrete room, cutting up cases of strawberries, pineapples, watermelon, and cantaloupes, and putting them into plastic cups to sell in the grab and go. It was depressing, mind-numbing work, and when I would see all my friends who were let back to work up front, a quiet anger was planted inside of me. Kitty was gone on my last day when I clocked out at the end of my shift, slipping out and knowing I would never have the chance to confront her. I walked out into the warm August night, and as I drove against the blinding sunset above the lake, a quiet catharsis washed over me as I thought about the past three years. I realized the poor treatment she had thrown at me was worth it. The friends I made, the interesting customers I met, I met the stories I had, my personal growth, that was something she couldn't take from me. My anger seemed to be pulled out the open window and into the lake, into the wind above the lake, dancing behind me as I drove home. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, so I think we have uh, some time for questions. Um, and I'll start, I'll start us off uh, thinking about the way all of your work uh, approach place we have um, you know, the, the, the long view, the witness of travel in a Corinne's piece. We have the, 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 the setting and formative space of memory in Amelia's piece. We have, uh, you know, a community um, and, uh, you know, place as, 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 as a populated thing in Elizabeth's piece. And in Dan's place, the, the place is like a, a setting, a container, you know, that, that it brings us into a very internal space. So and that's, that's what I saw in, in the places and all, in all of your works. So could each of you talk about this a little bit? Like how, how does place come into your work? What, is it something that just ends up on the page? Do you have to reach for it? Um, do you think about it or is it just, is it there already? Um, and uh, uh, let's just go in. Let's just go in order and start with Corinne. Uh, for this specific piece, the place was kind of like the center of the story. Uh, this was part of a travel series that I'm doing, so place is the center of all of the stories. So that's just kind of how it. Okay, that's kind of how it came into be. It came into creation. Okay. 
Amelia? Yeah, um, so usually with my writing, I feel like I focus on people and my relationship with them, but um, Professor Morano is here. I took a uh, study abroad class this past winter and the prompt was talk about like the place you grew up. So that could have been the house, the street, the city. Um, so that was really just the driving factor of this whole narrative. And I chose to focus on the street because I think it was the most interesting thing and the formative thing in my childhood. Um, so that's where I got that. I don't think, but place is hard. I think it usually just seeps into my narratives rather than being the central driving force. Um, Dan. Um, so yeah, there was a long time I didn't really care about like where things were set or placed, but um, I think with this, um, well, I think that like, especially since uh, like the strange whiplash of being at college and being in such a different place and then being home because um, I live in the suburbs, um, it started making me think about how uh, like, like you change based on like where you are. Um, and then I don't know, like specifically like in the grocery store, like um, I had a lot of like, I've had a lot of like very, this is going to sound strange, like emotional experiences at Kohl's because like when you're there, you just feel like, like you see all the clothes that like, and like, like old wives shopping for their husbands. And you're like, oh man, am I going to be that old one day? Um, it's just like a very strange existential uh, place you find yourself in. So I was really inspired by that. Um, you know, I, I think I just have to comment on, on what, what you say about the whiplash, you know, so many of you have experienced this term because, you know, as, as painful and difficult as this term has been, I think it, there's, there's, I mean, I'm sure Michelle can back me up on this, you know, um, that is a lesson in place. You you know, I've written whole books about how you're different in different places. Yeah, right? You know, and also the meta thing. Yeah, where I've had a number of students in classes reading pieces about a memory of a place that they were back in, right? Yeah. Um, Elizabeth, how about you? Yeah, um, this was a really, formative place for me during my teenage years, which is kind of odd, like you wouldn't think a grocery store would be like that. But um, yeah, it kind of reminded me of like a theater just in all the different characters and like there was always movement um, and things like that. So I was really inspired by that um, when I wrote it. It was for Ted Anton's creative nonfiction class and the prompt was a bad job story, but it wasn't really a bad job. Um, it was just, you know, really important to me, so. Uh, jobs are stories, right? Uh, other questions? Actually, I have a question for everybody, if you all just want to answer in the same sort of rotation. Um, I was uh, wondering how all of you think um, place and, and people interact in your writing, um, uh, because those seem like the two uh, you know, you can, you can say like setting or character or whatever, but those seem like the two, um, the, the two big things that get brought up in, in most fiction, uh, in most uh, like discussions of fiction or in creative nonfiction. Um, so yeah, how do y'all think um, uh, place and, and people uh, interact? Um, well, for my specific, my piece, the specific piece, uh, people on place interact because I'm uh, writing about the people that live there. So I'm kind of focusing on their daily interactions, the things that they do while in the specific place, the, con the contrasting uh, locations of being in the resort and how they act when they're in their uh, home setting, their natural setting. So kind of that's kind of how people in place interact in the specific story. And how does that affect, how does that affect how you, how you write the story? Like, how do you, um, uh, like, like, are there any kind of craft moves that you use to try to, uh, like, relate people and place to one another? I wouldn't say that there's a, are you asking if there's a specific thing that I do to make them relate to each other? <laughs> yeah, if, I mean, if there is, just, uh, yeah. Um, not entirely. I'm just kind of writing uh, based off of 
more so just observation than just what I was seeing. Uh, not necessarily trying to, uh, I mean, the, they're interacting and the, play, the people are interacting with the place themselves. I'm not really sure how I can make it much more uh, clearer than, than just writing what I'm seeing and writing what I remember seeing. So, sort of like a journalistic. Yeah, uh, something like, like a journalistic entry, kind of. I just want to comment on the point of view in your piece too, which I don't mean in the same sense, sense as fiction point of view, but the literal point of view, which yeah. was counted up and kept changing. The, mm -hmm. the higher we go, the more the narrator sees. You know, that's a craft room. Yeah. Yeah, I think for me, like Professor Borch said earlier, um, we act different in different spaces and those really influence the characters like the setting does and vice versa. Um, so I think that's how I use it. I think for each piece of writing I have, there's a different thing that stands out to me that I focus more on first. So for this, it was like the setting was the kernel that started this story, but I was like, what makes this place interesting? And that's the people. Um, and so, and I think too, I really like um, observing like human interactions and how we act with one another. So for me, like relationships are usually what I like to focus on and what interests me most as a writer. And then um, I think setting kind of bleeds into that in the same space. I do think um, for me, like my writing process is usually very kind of sporadic and jumbled. So um, writing down whatever comes to mind at first and then getting feedback and then maybe adding setting more into the later stages. Yeah, I'm definitely also interested in um, like setting as like a reflection of the character, like um like that's like a i don't know a little bit of like a basic like craft move um of like if you're gonna have an old man like him sitting on like a like a creaky decaying a decaying porch but like um yeah i'm definitely more interested in now like starting with the place um like uh i had this great reading um that kathleen rooney had us do and one of them was about how like um i don't remember what author said but just like i don't think of any place as really typical um, like when you think of like a, like if an author says like, or in a play, like a typical classroom, like, do they mean like, or typical office? Like what do, do they mean? It looks like an office. Do they mean like it's somewhere cold, uh, or like impersonal or sterile? Um, and I'm also interested in like the setting, not being just like a backdrop, but something that can interact and come into play later in the story. Like if, you know, if everyone's, if the story is about a bunch of people on a cliff, I want, you know, something to fall off of that cliff later. Yeah, I think um, the setting of my story definitely influenced uh, everyone I talked about. Um, there's always a weird dichotomy that I noticed between, because uh, it was in kind of like a wealthier area, like, the high school students, all of them like didn't need this money that they were working for, but like the, my older coworkers, like this is how they paid the rent, you know what I mean? And it influenced how they act and acted um, every day. And I don't think my boss uh, necessarily would have um, acted the way she did towards me if she maybe wasn't working there. Um, obviously not that there's nothing there's anything wrong with working in a grocery store as a career but um it definitely kind of um influenced how she act, acted towards me yeah i mean um, workplaces are intersections right so people people encounter each other who might not um otherwise so that's that's another great function of place is who is together in this place that wouldn't be together in any other place right um uh, are we sticking to the time exactly, Chris, or what's what's the timeline here? No, I think we've got a little wiggle room. Um, yeah. Uh, is uh, is it? Would anyone else like to ask a question? Anyone? Um, Okay, let's go around one more time. I want to hear one more thing from the writers. Um, where is one place that you would like to be when we are no longer under any kind of quarantine? Uh, do you mean like a 
like a store or, or something or do you mean like travel wise like what type of place that we would anywhere uh well i think because i'm writing a travel series i definitely would like to go on a trip or something once this is all over so uh maybe back to england so i can do more research one of my stories that i'm doing right now it's easier than trying to look it up on the internet so <laughs> Um, quarantine started when my birthday came around, my 21st birthday, so I would like to go to a bar and have my first legal drink, um, but I'd also like to go to Beirut eventually, which is where we were supposed to go on our study abroad over spring break, and unfortunately we couldn't do that. Um, I recently learned about in Chicago a theater company called the Neo Futurists, and they do a show where they put on uh, 30 plays in 60 minutes. Um, so I'm, I would definitely want to go back there. Um, I definitely would like to be in London right now. Um, it's like my favorite city and I just, if I could be on a plane there right now, I would, so. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you so much, everyone. Chris, do you want to say the closing? Or? Yeah, thanks everybody for coming. And uh, please do come and check out some of the other panels. I know we've got some people just kind of listening in. Uh, now uh, we've got panels all day um, till five o'clock. So uh, yeah, just, just come in when you can. And uh, if you need to leave early, that's fine too. Uh, it's not very disruptive over Zoom, which is nice. So yeah, 